Okay, this said it all. So good morning, everyone. Uh, Zoom call for everyone. Um, the I want to, um, I don't know, apologize is the right word, but uh, I guess notify the, uh, this as you all know, the shear was not an originally scheduled shear. The, uh, the request to give it uh, at short notice. And um, also many of you, I don't know if, if many of you have heard, I think most of you may, may have heard, um, Yeshiva Eretz at Tzvi is uh, moving campuses. So we're moving uh, Bezrat Hashem to the campus of Machon Lev um, for Elul, and we're actually going to be starting there in uh, next week already with the, the students that we have for in our summer program. So it's been a very, very hectic time, a good time, and uh, with a lot of uh, expectations and promise in the air. But uh, you know, not only not only COVID in the air, but uh, promise in the air as well. So um, we are, uh, but it's been very, very busy, uh, good busy. So I'm uh, uh, going to um, be uh, giving a shear that we we that we visited. Uh, uh, a few years back, a topic that we spoke about in terms of uh, Parshat Pinchas um, uh, on the question of uh, the history of uh, vigilantism in the uh, in Halacha. Um, so it's a uh, you know it was a popular shear then, and uh, hopefully it will be uh, on the rebroadcast as it were. People will enjoy it. Um, so here is the uh, let me put up the makarot. Okay, and make it a little bit larger for everyone. Um, everyone see it? Okay, I'm assuming that if you couldn't see it, you tell me. So um, the um, so this is what uh, I'd like to discuss. Basically, when we are um, when we look at Pinchas and the story, and we'll go through the story quickly just to bring everyone up to speed on it. When you look at the story, so the question that needs to be uh, asked is, well, is this something which we should be, besides understanding the story in of itself, but is this something which should be a, uh, a paradigm uh, for, future, um, for future generations? Um, how would you apply it? Um, is it something which is totally uh, in the hands of the individual? Um, as vigilantism is generally going to be almost by definition? Is it something that the system is um, curbs, it tries to uh, put uh, limitations on of some kind? So these are, are the type of issues that uh, we need to, to be looking at. So the, the Torah tells us that the, um, gives us a, uh, a bit of a background. Uh, the uh, we had this is the end of last week's parsha that uh, after the uh, all the entire story of, uh, of Balak and Bilam etc. So the Torah tells us Vayeshev Yisrael Bashitim Vayechal Ha'am Liznot at Be'el Benot Moab. So the uh, Yisrael at that point um, settled in this area of Shitim and immediately the people began to um, engage in sexual activity with uh, the daughters of Moab. So they uh, called to the people to sacrifice to their gods, and indeed the people ate and bowed to their, to their gods. Vayichar Af Hashem Yisrael, and Bnei Yisrael cleaved to Baal Peor. Apparently, that was the name of the the deity that was being uh, worshipped, and God um, became angry with Yisrael. Now, this combination, and we'll come back to this a little bit, that there seems to be a combination of uh, of the, of two uh, components: uh, the idea that you have both the uh, the sexual element as well as the um, the pagan worship um, most likely 
though it's not a totally explicit in the Psukim, most likely you're dealing with a scenario where the two were intertwined um, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the pagan rite in of itself, um, quite possibly um, involved um, uh, sexual activity. Um, the, um, so this is, um, this is what's occurring. The Torah tells us that God um, himself is angry. Vayichar af Hashem Yisrael. Vayomer Hashem pasuk dalet. Vayomer Hashem al Moshe. Kach et kol rashi ha'am. Vahoka otam Hashem neged Hashemesh. Vyashov charon af Hashem mi Yisrael. So here God doesn't strike out. At least it's not uh, explicit that there is some kind of, um, uh, uh, we'll call it, um, uh, expression of God's anger beyond God telling Moshe to take the leaders, kachet rashi ha'am, v'hokatam l'ashem, and basically deged ha'shamesh, appoint them to God before the, in front of the sun, meaning out in the open, the idea here is that God's anger is going to be, um, is going to subside. And the way to deal with that, at least the way that Hashem is speaking to Moshe, is to um, use the system. In other words, kol ha'am. This is the, um, it's not um, an expression of, um, of, of vigilantism in any way. It's a question of dealing with a crisis in a measured and in a um, responsible manner with the leaders um, at, the, at the helm. Vayomer Moshe el Shoftei Yisrael, and who are the Rashi Ha'am? The Shoftei Yisrael. So they are people who are going to um, have due process in terms of dealing with this, you have to take action, you the Shoftim. And so you're going to go and, um, and execute the, the people who are guilty of the crime. And now Pasuk Vav is where things go askew. Because so we have the, um, this, uh, this perpetrator who is not um, named at this point, who will only be named in next week's meeting or this week's Parsha, Parsha Pinchas, uh, Zimri ben Salu. But at this point, we don't know who he is. He's a person who takes the Midianit. Um, and he is, it's brazen. It's le'enei Moshe u'le'enei kol adat b'dei Yisrael. Right? Um, basically, it's flouting the system. It's saying, here you've set up the shoftim. I don't care about your shoftim. They don't, they're, they're, there's a total breakdown in the system. And that's reflected by the hema bochim petach o'el mo'ed. So the um, those same Rashi Ha'am, the same, same Shoftei Yisrael, Moshe himself, are crying, meaning that they are in effect powerless um, in the, uh, at, the, uh, entry, at the entryway to the Oel Moed. And this is the background for Pinchas. So here we now have the um, the switch, instead of it being the Shoftei Yisrael, we have it's Vayar Pinchas is now, he's the one who takes the lead, and he now takes his spear. Vayavo achar ish Yisrael ala kuba, vayitkoret shnehem et ish Yisrael vet ha'ish el kovata, vateatzer ha'magifa me'al b'nei Yisrael. Um, and so the, um, he takes the action, he um, goes, there's the play on the word of kuba here, meaning the, the cubicle, and, but he, um, he spears, he skewers the two people, Aisha el-Kovata, to her, her stomach, 
Vateyatzer um, ha and so the uh, and the, the the plague stops. Now remember, we hadn't been told about a plague, but here this is an expression that of of Charon uh, af Hashem, as if this is the um, what we said earlier that God vayichar af Hashem b'Yisrael v'yashov Charon af Hashem b'Yisrael, and the way that it's supposed to be dealt with is seems to be through due process, but something's happening while the process is occurring. And there's this magefa, there is this plague which is befalling the people. So we have the 24,000 who have um, uh, who have fallen, and this is the beginning of our parsha. So the um, so God is explicit that Heshiv et Chamati. This is a, again the same words that we saw before. Before it was Vayashov Charon Af. Here it's Chema, but it's, it's, it's the same idea, the same Heshiv. He was the one who took the uh, this matter into his hands, and he was the one who was able to. Um, to, to, to stop God's anger, and through Bikano et Kinati Bitocha. He was a, in fact, there's the, he's the Kanai, he's the zealot, but the zealotry was for, um, was the same zealotry as the, in terms of that God himself was expressing. And the, what's curious here is that um, we get the, idea of um, So the response is that he now is given a, um, um, a, uh, a covenant of peace. The shalom and the, the kina, the zealotry, which are, of course, polar opposites in terms of what they are meant to express. So that is the, the reward. So if you're looking at it just from a, um, as a, you know, just the, that quick overview of the, the story that we just went through. So the, um, the impression that you're getting is that it's a, um, that, that you have, there was an attempt to have a, uh, a full uh, judicial process that attempt uh, failed, um, and as a result, the, um, the Pinchas has to take the action in his uh, own hands, um, and that's what, what changes everything. Now, the, um, given the impression, of course, not only does it change everything, but it also um, now gets its expression that he um, becomes part of the system by become, getting the Brit Shalom, um, and the, um, and the kuna for, for, uh, for future generations. The shalom, of course, could be, and this, we're not going to see this inside, but there's an expression of this in, in various uh, midrashim, that the, um, because this was extrajudicial, so you could get the impression that perhaps uh, there's no um, indication that necessarily the Pinchas did the right thing. Um, so, so uh, ha, God himself has to um, get involved to make sure that Pinchas isn't punished uh, unjustly for, uh, for his action. So that's the, um, that's the background. Now, with this in mind, we now um, fast forward, as it were, to um, Sefer Maccabim. And Sefer Maccabim um, is written in the end of Bayit Sheni, um, the, there's the, whether it's exactly at the time of the Hashmonayim or a generation or two afterwards, looking back, matter for scholars to debate. But we're, doing, we're talking about now the end of Bayit Sheni and the way that this action of Pinchas is looked at, namely with the story of Matityahu. Um, Matityahu, um, of course, um, as, as we're familiar with from, from the Hanukkah story. 
So Matityahu begins the rebellion by, um, by executing someone who was um, bringing a, uh, a sacrifice, if I recall correctly, it was a pit, to, a, um, to one of the Greek gods. And the uh, Sefer Maccabim reports, um, we don't have the, uh, the original Hebrew, so the, um, I'm working with the, uh, uh, the English translation from the, uh, from the Greek. Um, when Matityahu saw this, he was fired with zeal, stirred to the depth of his being. He gave vent to his legitimate anger, threw himself on the man, and slaughtered him on the altar. So the... Um, Matityahu takes action into his own hand. At the same time, he killed the king's commissioner, was there to enforce the sacrifice, and tore down the altar in his zeal for the law, right, the kin'ah, right, so that was presumably um, the, the term that was used originally, um, if the translation of the translation is accurate here. So the kano et kinati. So finds its expression in the zeal for the law. He acted as Pinchas had against Zimri, the uh, son of Salu. So um, at least in the eyes of, maybe not of Matityahu, um, though probably in the eyes of Matityahu as well, um, and, but certainly in the eyes of the, the author of, um, the, uh, of uh, Sefer Maccabim, so the I, that what Matityahu was doing was he was walking in the footsteps of his great 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 granddaddy Pinchas, who also, as a Kohen, took matters into his own hand and um, killed people who were worshiping Avodah Zarah. Um, here, of course, there isn't any um, reference to um, any uh, sexual activity, but. Why should we need it? Well, as we, it's sufficient to be saying that if you have um, this pagan practice going on uh, in your backyard um, and you need to put a stop to it, and, there's no, and we'll, uh, we'll say that there's no court to, to deal with it, because after all, the uh, king's commissioner is right there, and so the courts are, um, are not operating. So someone has to take action into their own hands. And that's going to be Matityahu in this case. And of course, the fact that the rebellion is, um, is sparked by this incident, and then the result is the establishment of the, or the reestablishment of the, um, of the Mikdash um, and, the, um, and for the, the first time um, since the, um, I guess, maybe even since the Assyrian conquest, um, and certainly since the Babylonian conquest, for the first time you're going to have an independent Jewish commonwealth, uh, which will last for about, um, well, depends on what you want to say that it, that it ended, but it'll last for close to 200 years. So this is a sign of the fact, another breach shalom, as it were. Um, and what, what Matityahu um, then says, Matityahu went through the town shouting at the type of his voice, let everyone who has any zeal for the law and takes a stand on the covenant come out and follow me. So this is a, a cry of mi Lashem Eli. So this is very similar to the, I didn't mention this before, but the, um, if, we're not going to get into it right now, but if the story of Baal Peor has parallels and antecedents in the story of the Egel, where Moshe himself had been the Kanai, now, there, had, there, were no, there were no courts at that point. Moshe comes down from, uh, from, from Sinai. He has the Luchot. He breaks the Luchot. He says, Mila Shem Eli, and he calls, and it's B'nai Levi who, um, who, who join up. So here you again have a very similar type of situation. Um, also there, the, the Torah says, Vayekumo Am Litzachet. So not only is there Avodah Zarah, there is also this, there it's less explicit, but it's litzachek, right, that they, the, the people reveled, um, that is also indicative of, um, of sexual, um, at, at, we'll say at the very least sexual activity, but quite possibly sexual rights that are going on as well. So this is the, 
the, the background, you have a, you can now draw a direct line from the um, from the Egel to Peor to um, 1500 or so years later, maybe less than that, it's over, about a thousand years later, to the story of the Maccabin. So there's a direct line that is being that can, that being drawn and um, and absolutely no sense of any limitation, censure, or etc. This is um, exactly what Levi'im and Kohanim are supposed to do, perhaps by extension all of us are supposed to do, given these kind of circumstances. So that's what um, where things uh, would have stood, I suppose, had history not taken a different turn. And here, I just want to take a, a snippet from um, an article by Professor uh, Jakob Blitzstein, um, a, a short article. Um, I recommend um, people take a look at it. Um, it's a very interesting article. There, this is a, it's only about four pages long. Basically what he, um, uh, what he points out in the, um, in the article is that when you talk about Chanukah in Chazal, that um, the, the, the Chanukah story that we were taught going back to the time that I remember, the first time I remember he, uh, hearing about the story of Matityahu, I must have been seven or eight years old, maybe even younger, I don't even know. But around that age, reading um, you know, these kind of stories that were written for children, and the, um, but there is no mention of these stories um, in, uh, in any source in Chazal. Not in the Gemara, not, certainly not in the Mishnah, not in the Midrashim, etc. You don't have a discussion of the Mityavnin. You don't have a discussion of the Hellenizers, the Jewish Hellenizers. Um, the, um, uh, we do not know of a Matityahu who kills a Jewish idolater. Right? The incident that we just read doesn't appear in Chazal. It does not further tell of a civil war as the genesis of Hanukkah. But th this is this idea of um, the, the battle between the, um, the Maccabim and the Mityavnim does not exist. Al Hanisim does tell the battle of the pure against the impure, the few against the many, the wicked against those who study Torah. But it's clear that it's a struggle of the Jewish people against the Gentile persecutor. Ironically, those who argue that. Um, Hanukkah delegitimizes any but authentic Jewish culture, find their only source for that reading outside the Talmud in works which never entered the canon of Jewish learning. Right? So that's a very, that's an aside, but that's very interesting. I know it's from in authentic Jewish sources, we do not talk about the battle of Hanukkah as being the battle of the um, of Jewish culture or Jewish religion against um, foreign influences in, um, in the Jewish people. That's not mentioned in Chazal at all. Um, so of course, the question then becomes, why repress memory of Jewish Hellenizers and of civil war as the matrix of Hanukkah? So Professor Blitzstein doesn't have an answer. I have no definitive answer or even suggestion, but then he finally does give one. Finally, the idea that a holiday could be the outcome of civil war between Jews proposition which encourages and legitimates intra-Jewish uh, militancy may simply have been unacceptable Chazal, to Chazal. Indeed, the more immediate memory of the struggle against Rome, the struggle marked by the intramural Jewish antagonism and even bloodshed taught a different lesson. You know, it's here, after all, if we, um, uh, and I, I, as I said at the, at the outset, um, I didn't have a, a chance to um, to, uh, uh, to update the sheet for today's year, but given the fact that it's Shiva and the, um, the perhaps the most famous uh, idea with regard to the background for Khorba, um in Chazal is the Gemara in Yoma, perhaps the Gemara in Gitin, the idea that the, um, that the second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam, however you want to define Sinat Chinam, and the factionalism and the intramural um, uh, violence that occurred between, um, uh, between different groups of Jews. 
And that's what led to the Chorban. So the last thing that um, Tanaim and Amoraim, who are living within um, living memory for some of them, um, of the events of the Chorban, um, after all, keep in mind that the Chorban takes place in the year 70, and the Mishnah is compiled in the year 200 approximately. So that, with that within that, uh, just a little bit over a century, and you have Bar Kokhba in the middle, so you have a, um, the, the memory of the, the, what, what befell the Jewish people is so incredibly fresh that to take the Hanukkah story and to um, glorify the, um, the, the Civil War and to hold that as being a value that have becomes anathema. And so as a result, and again, we can't prove it, that this is the reason why it's uh, deleted from the Chazal record, but it's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good theory to throw out that the, the, uh, the, atta- the view of zealotry in general um, and civil war in particular um, takes on a very different cast when um, viewed not after the victory of the Chashmonaim, but after the destruction of Yerushalayim. So that's the, um, so that perhaps is going to uh, influence how this idea of uh, Kana'ut plays out on the halachic level as well. So here you have, just to give another example of Kana'ut during where, where and the, it's a critique, and, but also a very uh, sharp, um, definition of what's going on um, at the time immediately before the Chorba. The source number four here. Tanu Rabbanan, Ma'aseh B'Shnei So this is a story of two Kohanim. Sh'ayu Shnei'em Shavim V'Ratzim V'Olim B'Kedash. So the two Kohanim, this is a Tosefta um, in uh, Mesechet Yoma, and here it's brought in the Gemara in Yoma. The um, the Tosefta tells of two Kohanim who are racing up the ramp to the Mizbeach. Now, the background for this is that the, um, uh, the, the, the first uh, avodah of the day, the Trumat Hadesha, the cleaning of the Mizbeach, um, of the remains of the previous day's Korbanot, so originally was given to the first Kohen who made it up the ramp. People would, you know, it's, it's at the crack of dawn, it's even earlier, it's around um, four o'clock in the morning today, let's say, um, and you would have to, the Kohenim who would be there, so they would get the, the right to, to do the Truman Hadesh. And the first Kohen who made it up, he would, up the ramp, he would be the one who would receive this honor. The, um, so there was a race, two Kohanim are going, uh, who were running up. So one of them get, got into the other's two meters, right? Four Amot are two meters. So they, um, there was a breach of social distancing um, on, the, and on the race. It seems to me that the one Kohen pushed the other one out of the way so that he would get into the, to the, to the top first. Natal Sakin de Takalo Belibo. So it created a, um, a, a, a rage incident where the other Kohen took out a knife and murdered the Kohen who had um, pushed him. Basically, he took out a knife, he plunged it into his heart. Ahmad Rabit Sadok, Amalo Ta'ulam. So Rabit Sadok, who was a Kohen, and Rabbi Tzadok is also a person who is um, a, alive at the time of the Chorban. He's mentioned in the story of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai um, and meeting Vespasian. So he asks for, um, uh, for physicians to help heal Rabbi Tzadok. Because Rabbi Tzadok had, was, had fasted for decades um, before the Chorban in order to prevent the Chorban. And who knows, maybe this incident is what uh, started Rabbi Tzadok on his fast. 
Amad Rabbi Tzadok Amalot Ha'ulam. So he was standing on the steps of the um, of the Beit Hamikdash uh, sanctuary. Amar Achenu Bnei Yisrael Shimu. So he calls out to everyone there. Harehu Omer ki matzei chalal ba'adama v'yatzus kenecha v'shoftecha. So the Torah tells us that if someone, um, if a, a body is found and we don't know who the perpetrator is, we measure between the neighboring towns and villages. Anu almi lahavi agla arufa. Who should we bring an agla arufa for? Obviously, he's speaking metaphorically. We know who the murderer is. We know um, what the story is. Um, it's a question of who's responsible. So, al ha'ir o al azarot. Who's really responsible here? Is this something Rav, uh, Rav Luchtenstein used this um, this Gemara in the aftermath of the uh, Rabin assassination to basically under, to say who's responsible? Is it society as a whole? Is it ha'ir, or is it the azarot? Is it something which is internal here in the mikdash? Right? Is it internal to our community? That's the the question that Rabbi Tzadok wants to know. So everyone uh, who was present began to cry. It's reminiscent of the Hema Bochim, which we started the the shir with of Pinchas. They're crying out um, at the, the the entrance to the Oel Moe, and here too the people are crying out at this expression of violence um, at the um, at the at, inside the Beit Hamikdash. Now, here comes the punchline, though. Ba aviv shel tinok, u matzuo keshehu mifaper. So the father of this young Kohen, who's the victim, the Kohen who was murdered, comes to his son's body and sees that his son is still alive. He's still twitching, mifaper. Amar, and this is the father of the victim's words, this is your, this is your uh, atonement. My son is still twitching. He's still alive. The knife, as a result, is not yet tame. Only if the knife is in contact with a dead body would the knife become impure, ritually impure. This knife can still be used in the Mikdash. It doesn't have to undergo any purification. And the, the uh, Tosefta ends, L'lamdecha shekashe alehem tarat kelim yoter mishfichut damin. This teaches you how the society at the time, or the Kohanim at the time, are more concerned with the ritual purity, ritual impurity of the knife, than they are with the fact that a murder just took place. Now it's here the Brita is giving us really this ex expression of what um, is the, um, uh, the, the price of Kana'ut, the Jehantalism. Now granted, of course, the, there was no Avera here. Um, that, after all, there was no Avodah Zarah. There was no um, Gilui Arayot. It was, um, at the most, this would be akin to the to today to uh, a case of road rage. Okay, that's what took place here. But still, the idea that what's important, what are our values? So the values, and this is obviously being the the, the critique of. Rabbi, of, uh, of Rabbi Tzadok himself and the critique of the narrator of the story that this is where our society or the Kohanim society has has um, excuse me has, uh, has, has reached this, this is the depth that we've reached that they care more about the ritual impurity than they care about um, murder um, this is is echoing what I think that uh, the idea that uh, Professor Blitzstein is saying. This is what, and this is, as I said, leads to the Chorban. This is the degeneration of the Chorban, 
And this is what's going on in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, that, as I said, is sort of a, as a background. Now let's take a look at some of the examples where halachically we talk about kanaim pogin bo. When we talk about this idea that a zealot, a vigilante, can take the law into their own hand. And the Mishnah in Sanhedrin says the following. So somebody who steals a, um, a vessel from the Beit HaMikdash. That's what a kasva is. HaMikalel B'Kosem. Somebody who curses God's name, curses God with a, um, a, 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 a incantation um, of some kind. HaBoel Aramit. Someone who has relations with a non-Jewish woman. Kanaim Poginbo. Now the Mishnah ends with the following uh, a fourth case, Kohen sheshimesh bitumah, right? The same tumah that we were just talking about in the previous uh, the, the, the previous case. Kohen sheshimesh tumah ein echav a kohanim mevi'in So the um, the other the fellow kohanim don't need to bring him to a uh, a beitin. Ela pirchei kuna meltzin alto chutz la'azara. So the punishment for um, presumably not knowingly serving in the Beit HaMikdash when one is impure is that the other Kohanim are supposed to clean up the Mikdash. How do they do that? By taking him out of the Mikdash and executing him on the spot. And the way that it's be, the execution is going on is a particularly... Um, grisly type of execution, right? So they uh, uh, basically, uh, they split his head uh, asunder. Because that's the, um, this is the, the three or perhaps four cases where we talk about um, the idea of kanaim um, pogimbo. Now, one has to ask, what do these, um, uh, why these specific uh, uh, avera? Um, the um, they don't have necessarily have to be. Uh, they're, it, the, they're not the most severe uh, crimes um, uh, on the books. Um, there isn't even a mention of avodah zarah here as being a reason for vigilantism. Um, the the case of uh, matityahu does not fall into the uh, into the mishnah. I mean, not only the historical case doesn't fall in. But the idea that this is a crime that you would talk about Kanaim Poginbo doesn't, uh, doesn't appear here. Um, what do they all have in common? So it would seem um, that what they, they have in common is that there is a violation of, the, um, of, of a larger sanctity that um, that is being uh, and uh, uh, and a divine sanctity. If you're talking about the the, the the cases that are on the brackets, you have the goneve takasva. You have somebody who steals a, a vessel from the Beit Hamikdash, misappropriation of uh, of, uh, of, 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 of of property that belongs to the um, to the Beit Hamikdash, and use in chulin. So that's a, uh, a violation of the sanctity of the Mikdash. And of course, on the other side, you have the Kohen who is um, serving with this, um, um, in the state of impurity, also violating the sanctity of the Mikdash. Um, in the middle, you have the case of Mikalel Kosem. So you are, have a person who is directly attacking God by not only mentioning his name, this isn't the case of uh, blasphemy in that sense, but it's blasphemy in that he's actually cursing God. So this is a, um, a, a, a something for, um, that's going to fall into the category of Naim Poginbo. And then you have the case of Boel Aramit. Now Boel Aramit isn't so clear. Why should this be the, the case? And the Gemara says that the, um, uh, the idea is that it is um, um, 
the idea that the um, uh, and the Gemara asks, "Bagda Yehuda b'Toyba Nastav b'Yisrael b'Yerushalayim." This is the Gemara explaining the different cases that Yehuda has um, uh, has was was boged, so had uh, betrayed God, and a Toyba has been done in Yisrael. What is the Toyba? Uh, what is this abomination? Ki chilal Yehuda Kodesh Hashem Asher Ahav, that Yehuda has um, uh, blasphemed the uh, the Kodesh the, um, that that he had loved, who Baal Bat El Necha, and um, had uh, literally had relations with the daughter of a foreign god. Um, so the drasha on this idea is Bagda Yehuda Zo Avoda Zara U Baal Bayat El Nechar Zehabal An Hanukhu. So the the uh, betrayal is Avoda Zara. The um, expression of it is to have relations with a non-Jewish woman. The idea being, well, on a pshat level, you would say, well, of course, these are two things that are going to be going hand in hand along the lines of um, the, the story of, at the, uh, of Pinchas. Again, that you have this intertwining of, excuse me, of the Vodazara, of pagan worship, alongside with uh, ritual sexual activity. I'll just say as an aside that this is quite possibly, though we don't know for with 100% assurity, but it certainly is a, a strong possibility, that the reason why um, we do not have uh, priestesses, right? we don't have this idea of a kohanot, but benot kohanim, uh, um, having a role in the mikdash. So for another shir, right, um, it's a very interesting uh, discussion. What is the sanctity of a, of a, um, a daughter of a kohen? or a, a, we'll say, a, a Kohenet, okay? Is there such a concept? Does she have uh, inherent kedusha, or is the kedusha only passed on to the, the males? Spoiler alert, I think that there's inherent kedusha in the females as well. However, that's not, but what's totally clear is that there is no role whatsoever for, um, for Kohanot, in the Mikdash itself. All of the um, activities of the, uh, in the Mikdash are, set, are explicitly B'nai Aharon HaKohanim, not the daughters, um, and, and for, for good reason. It's, it's quite possible that the Torah wants to make sure that there is no um, intermingling of the, uh, of, uh, of, of our Avodah, not Avodah Zarah, of our Avodah, with any ritual sexual activity. And the way to do that is to make sure that the priestesses aren't on, aren't on the campus. They're not there. There are no such things as kohanot. So but this combination is, um, is quite possible as to why, the, uh, when looking at the Pasuk in Malachi, so that's the, the idea here. However, Chazal took it one step further and said, no, it's Boel Aramit, it's Boel Nochrit. Why? Um, the, um, the, whoever has it is as though they are marrying Avoda Zara. This is expressed, we'll skip a few, we'll come back to the, uh, uh, hopefully to the source I'm about to, to, to skip. What's going on here? So the, um, the Rambam makes the following observation. The Rambam says that um, this is source, um, just one second, I apologize. Uh, source number 12 here. The Rambam says that the lo pagu bo kanaim, the lo hilko beitin, hare em shom mefurash bedebrei kabbalah shahu bekare. So, speaking of, in general, a person who has um, relations with um, a non Jewish woman, so then the, uh, the, the punishment is correct. 
And he quotes the pasuk which we um, just uh, just said. This is the, um, it's a defilement of the sanctity of God. Now, the, the Rambam realizes that this is not the, the, the it's been divrei kabbalah shuhu bekaret. There is no iser, if you take a look at the, uh, the list at the end of Parshat Achremot, Parshat Kedoshim, where we have a list of all of the arayot, of all of the uh, sexual uh, relations which are banned and have karet. So a, um, a non-Jewish woman doesn't make the, make the list. It's only Bidivrei Kabbalah. Divrei Kabbalah for the Rambam means um, the, in the words of the Nevi'im. Right? It's based on this idea of, that we just read in the Pasuk in Malachi. It's not explicit. So, however, the Rambam says, what is the real problem here? Nikra mechalel kodesh Hashem. Here we have a, um, a, a person who is violating the, uh, the sanctity of God. Avon so the um, the Rambam is cognizant that it's not on the list. It's cognizant that I'm going to point this out and say, well, why are we so fired up? about this idea, about this type, this particular Avera, of, a, uh, of this, um, this intersexual uh, activity between Jew and non-Jew. Why is that so important? And the answer is because even though it doesn't have a capital punishment, and, it, uh, and other uh, Averot of Gilu Yarev do, nevertheless, don't let this make it a, any less severe in your eyes, because there is a tremendous loss. Yeshbo have said, right? You have a um, a tremendous loss to the Jewish people. The issue of this relationship, the child that comes from this relationship. So any other um, incestuous relationship or any other uh, adulterous relationship. So the, the child is a mamzer or mamzeret, but has full rights as a Jew, has full relationship with the parents. And now is not the time to get into what a mamzer is, but basically the, the, all of the responsibilities that a parent has for their child applies equally to a child who is designated as a mamzer is a, an illegitimate child. But that doesn't apply to a, um, the, the child born from a non-Jewish woman. Haben min akutit. However, the son from a non-Jew, Enobno, is not halachically considered, legally considered, to be a child of the, um, of the father. So it's basically, as we know, this is you know, a problem which is um, uh, comes down to 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 to, to this very day in uh, in massive proportion that um, a child of a mixed marriage is not considered to be a Jew, and if the mother isn't Jewish, so that the Rambam says is what is so terrible about this idea. So basically, you have a a sense, all of the examples that we spoke about in the Mishnah, that the issue here is primarily not one of the severity of the crime, but one of the, uh, the, the consequences that come out of the crime, that you have a uh, undermining and a violation of the kedusha, whether it's the kedusha of the Mikdash or it's the kedusha of 
the, um, of, the, of the person himself or herself in terms of the Kiddushat Israel, that is the, um, the crimes that allow for a um, Kana'i response. No other Aveira can, as severe as it may be. Now, this finds voice in the, um, in the Amora'im describing what Pinchas saw. In the previous uh, source here, number 11, so it's Bayar Pinchas ben Elazar. So what you have then is Amarav Ra'am Ma'asev Vidiskar Halacha. So Rav said, what did he see? He saw the act and he remembered the Halacha. Rav seems to be focusing on the activity itself. But Shmuel says, Shmuel Amar, Ra'ash ain Chochma ve'ain Tfuna ve'ain Eitzel Neged Hashem. So Shmuel says that, what did he see? He saw a hopeless situation. When, wherever you have a, um, a situation where you have chilul Hashem, so you don't wait for Moshe Rabbeinu in this case to give a psak halacha. You act accordingly. Chilul Hashem has to be um, has to be dealt with immediately. This is um, an expression of what Rabbi Yitzchak Amar Velazar says, Ra'a malach v'hishchit ba'am. That what Pinchas saw wasn't even the action of the Chilul Hashem in of itself, but the fact that the Chilul Hashem had had immediate consequences, that there was now a, a play going on with 24,000 people dead. That's what Pinchas felt needs to be addressed. Now, these last two ideas, and maybe Rav agrees to, to a certain extent as well, but certainly these last two ideas is limiting the, the, the Kana'ut. Because here we have a situation where um, zealotry is being, um, in terms of the legislation, as it were, is being limited to the very specific cases. I, I'll just also just point out a very, you know, an irony, which, you know, when we talk about the halachot of kana, kana'ut, there's, a, there's an irony of, involved. Um, the very fact that we are limiting the kana'i, that doesn't make much sense at all, right? Was, we're de- dealing with something which by its very uh, essence is um, anti, uh, I should say extra legal, okay? Maybe not anti, but certainly extra legal. And, um, and we're saying, well, we're going to tell you, we're going to legislate when you can break the system. Right? That very notion that we're going to legislate the, uh, and limit the application of vigilantism, right? so that is um, pretty remarkable when you think about it. Because after all, by definition, vigilante is somebody who's not working within the system. Let's uh, see some other limitations that, uh, that, that come up. The, um, here, the, um, um, okay, we don't have uh, time for that right now. Um, we'll take a look at um, who is the, um, uh, who's allowed to be a vigilante. So there's an interesting tshuva um, of uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein. Um, uh, written to one of his uh, sons-in-law, not to Rabbi Tendler, to another one of his sons-in-law, where he, uh, uh, so he was asked, this was in the 1950s, um, uh, it, was a, it was a short, um, uh, almost an essay, it was a letter written to him, but it was an essay which he writes about the Kana'im uh, Pogin, uh, this, this whole concept of, um, um, of the zealot and, and his actions. And he says the following, mm-hmm. It was by definition, you have the, the person who is the, uh, who is the kana'i 
has to be a person who is kasher. Rashi um, threw that in, um, and Rav Moshe is building on that one word that Rashi said, because Rashi didn't say, B'nai Adam hamit kanim, people who have this zealotry, but rather B'nai Adam k'sherim hamit kanim, people who are kasher, who have this. V'imu l'chavana acheret. Now this is just a, this line is just, you know, every time I read it, it, it really just uh, almost you know, uh, blows me away. Imu l'chavana acheret. So if I'm doing it for ulterior motivations, eno kanai. Haray eno kanai, velohu tarla. Okay, so it means if I have ulterior motivations, so I'm not allowed to pick up my spear. That, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm willing, you know, okay, I'm, 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 I'm able to hear that. But then, umamela hu rotseach mamash. Right, now that's very interesting. In other words, if I, there are two people um, who are, let's, Let's recreate the story of Pinchas. And there are two people who see Zimri ben Salu and Kazbi Batsur um, in the act. One's name is Pinchas. The other's name is Yehuda Sassman. Right? I'm put there. Pinchas is the kasher person. I'm not the kasher. I have an ax to grind or a spear to chuck, as it were, against Zimri ben Salu. And I am a little bit faster on the trigger than Pinchas is. We both lift up our spears. We both throw it. But my spear hits first. So then, according to Rav Moshe, I am a rotseach. I'm a murderer. Shuhu chayav mita, and it's a capital offense. Kefishi adua klapei shemaya. Now, of course, Moshe is not going to be able to know that. No one's going to know my motivations. I can hide behind the claim that I'm doing this um, as a, 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 a in the service of God. But God knows, right? Now that could explain why God has to give Pinchas his briti shalom because if Pinchas was doing this for any motivation other than um, the purest of motivations. So then, even though the act is an appropriate act, but if the, the, the person who's, who's following through on the act is not, is, is not appropriate, so then the act becomes murder. Right? So this is something which is really um, something to twist your mind, at least that I find I'm twisting my mind about it, even as I talk about it, that the same act under the same circumstances will be or not be considered murder based on the motivation of the person who is implementing it. We wouldn't say that about anything else. We wouldn't say, for example, if a person were... Um, let's say, the executioner in the Beit HaMikdash, uh, in, the, in the Beit Din, excuse me. Right? That's his job. He's the, the executioner. And he now takes a person out for skila, srefa, herod, whatever it may be, and his motivations aren't pure. We would never say that he's a murderer, He's acting appropriately in the circumstances. We might say that his, you know, he should read some Mesila Isharim before he does it. I don't know, right? He doesn't, he should be working on his motivations. But he's certainly not a Rotseach. He's, he's a, an officer of the court. What Rav Moshe is saying here is that he's not an officer of the court. The act of Kana'ut has to be done appropriately, otherwise... It is, um, it's, it's murder. So not only is there a limitation in the terms of the, the cases that it can be applied, but there's a limitation as to who um, uh, can uh, be the, the executioner. Okay? Now, the, um, the Rav Cook um, takes this one step further. Of course, Rav Cook wrote this before Rav Moshe did. Um, this, this is written about uh, 40 or so years before Rav Moshe's uh, tshuva that we just read. Rav Kook, in his 
commentary to the Siddur, the Olat Raya, so he says the following. This is on the, we read the Sukim of the beginning of Parshat Pinchas at the, at a Brit Milah. The Briti Shalom that's mentioned. The Kanoat Kinati. So when he talks about on that Pasuk of Kanoat Kinati, Rav Kook takes the, me, the opportunity to, to speak about um, Pinchas. And he says the following. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yachso V'hodil L'Kol Shetiv'o Shal Pinchas Hu Keteva Zikno Aharon HaKohen What's the idea that God said at the beginning of our parsha? and calls him Pinchas ben Alazar ben Aharon HaKohen to tell us that Pinchas is Aharon. Pinchas, who is at least prima facie, the anti-Aharon. Aharon is, as he continues, HaTov v'Ahuv l'Kol. Aharon was the good, the beloved to all. Rodef shalom, who strove for peace, right? The man of peace. The last thing that Aharon is, is a Kana'ai. He's the last uh, idea that we would consider him to be a zealot. But the idea of Rav Moshe, so just said that a person has to be kasher, right? Kasherim. Change the, the color here to make it match. But the um, but Rav Cook says that it's not enough to be an Adam Kasher. You have to be a person who is Aharon. You have to be a person who's the anti kanai Only an anti kanai can be a kanai Anyone who is not the anti kanai so they, they're not entitled to the um, to this. Now, uh, he gives this um, this is a based on a shiur that he gave, um, and it's not his, his own writings. But he, in a shiur of Cook, basically says the same idea as Rav Moshe in this point. But it's only under these circumstances that this this terrible act, the execution, as I said, the case that I gave you before, of a uh, executioner in Sanhedrin, that's not a, an act which is, um, is, is so, um, is not an act which is um, a, an act of, uh, of Isra. It's not an act which is mitame. That is a legitimate requirement of the court system. There is capital punishment in Judaism, and we're very, very careful about the meeting out of that punishment. And we have all of the guidelines in terms of a dut and due process, etc., which are there um, uh, that to uh, to really protect the uh, the innocent, to make sure, to the best of our ability, that no innocent person is executed um, for a crime that he or she did not commit. But once the sentence is, um, is handed out, so then it's not murder anymore. This is murder. This is, the Kanoet Kinati is murder. And only, Rav Kook is saying, only along the lines of Rav Moshe, only if it's being done in the most proper way, and the only way that we can assure that it's being done in the proper way is if the person himself is not a person who has um, any violent tendencies at all. So then, then we can talk about how they took the uh, they took this uh, action into their own hands um, because there was no other way of dealing with it. And then the kanaut becomes a um, legitimate uh, kanaut. Um, but this is to think about it. If you, if, if you, if you were to, if Rav Moshe if uh, Rav Kook were to be given the, um, the, were to be able to go to um, Matityahu and express this shita to him, 
Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they would be uh, you know, victims of Mat Matityahu's Kanaut as well. Oh, is this, this is so clearly not the approach which is being taken um, by, uh, at least by the author of Sefer Maccabim, in terms of understanding Matityahu's action. To be saying that this is, you know, that the, the Kanaut itself is, is so problematic, it's only under very specific circumstances and only very specific people. So this is um, clearly something which is um, not uh, along the lines of the way it was, um, of, of the way that it had been uh, understood um, earlier. Um, the, um, to, to, to finish up today, I have a few more minutes. So I'd like to, uh, we don't have time for all the Makoro. The, um, is to, um, to talk about the, um, the following uh, issue. Namely, um, if we are, um, just to, to, to close with the, the, the question is, is this a, once we've said that it becomes a, um, an, is, um, an, an, an is, excuse me, um, once it becomes limited to very specific cases. So now I have the case of, um, uh, of, of, of sexual relations between Jew and non-Jew. So is it under all circumstances that we would be viewing this um, as a, um, as not only a case for uh, Kanaim Poginbo, but um, for the Avera itself to be considered on this level? What needs to be done? So here, let me try to explain through the Makorot itself is what I'm trying to get at. The Rambab says the following, source number 15. Lo asra Torah, ela derech chatnut. Aval habala kutik derech znut, makinoto makat mardut midivrei sofrim, gzeira shema yavo lehit chate. So the Rambam, in discussing the isur of a, um, a relationship between Jew and non-Jew, says that the actual Isser on the book for the Torah is only um, if, the, uh, if there is an intermarriage. But if Habala Kutit Derech Znut, if the sexual um, activity was done not within the context of marriage, but was done uh, promiscuously, then the uh, punishment is um, lashes for rebelling against Chazal because it's a the Gezeira. There's no Isur Doraita to have sex with an Anju. The Isur Doraita is to marry an Anju. But then, of course, the um, the Rambam has to deal with the case of, of Pinchas. So what does he do do with that? Kol Haboel Kutit Ben Derech Hatnut Ben Derech Snut. So whether it is, if you have a, um, if you have this uh, sexual relation with the non-Jewish woman, whether it's derech is, uh, whether that was done in marriage or done promiscuously, in ba'ala b'farhesia, if it was done uh, publicly, v'hu shi'yiv'o le'inei asara mi'israel o yoter, in pagu bo kana'im v'hargo arei elu m'shubachin b'zrizin, so the Rambam, based on the Gemara, it's not the Rambam making this up, but that the only time that you have the, the death penalty that's attached, the, what we spoke about before, is when we're dealing with a situation where the, um, it, the act was done bifarhesia, was done um, publicly. And how do I define public? So you need a tzibur. You need a, at least a minion of witnesses that see this, and then the kanai can be pogeh. This is, again, the, um, this is all within this, the, the context that the, it's, the, it's not the Aveira per se, but it's the, because if it was the Aveira per se, what should it matter whether it's being done privately or it's being done publicly? What should it matter 
um, if the, you know, whether it, it, the, it should matter, so not what should matter. It should matter whether it's a Isra de Oraita or it's not an Isra de Oraita. Here, it's not the Avera per se, it's the violation of the sanctity that is being, um, that's being used. And here you have other examples that, the, that come up. The Rambam, the last line of the next halacha, and halacha hey, Rambam says, So the, um, if you have a, uh, a, a person who presumably in public, the, 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 the girl in question is non-Jewish. She's a bat ger toshav. Okay? She's, she is non-Jewish, but she herself is not a uh, idolatress. She's not a, a pagan. She is accepted upon herself the Shabbat Mitzvah B'nai Noach. She is living as a ger toshav, a legitimate, um, a legitimate resident um, in, the, in society. That's the, um, so that's the bot. Now, of course, if there will be children from this, uh, this, this uh, relationship, so the children will not be Jewish. But still, ein hakadaim pogimbo. So we don't have kanaim that will have the, uh, the pigia, kanaim cannot get involved here. Presumably, the Rambam doesn't explain why. This is a chidush of the Ramba, but the the presumably because you don't have that element of chilul Hashem, you don't have the element of the violation of the sanctity of Klal Yisrael. Even though the issue might uh, of the of the relationship might not be Jewish, but the the um, this idea that it's a it's a um, a, a direct affront to the Kedushat Yisrael, that um, isn't going on here. And therefore, it wouldn't carry the same kind of uh, penalty and Kanaim Pogin would not be um, allowed. The, um, the Ran, um, I'll just close with this Ran, because the Ran says the following. The Ran says, um, the, um, he just makes the following observation. Afagav, the Israel Habala Kutit Ika Karet. So even though um, the halacha is that a, um, a Jew who has relations with a non Jewish woman, the penalty, as we saw in the Rambam, could be Karet, Kidaakre Rab Lagamre, okay, um, and he brings various sources. Mikomakom here. What about the opposite? Kuti haba al bat Yisrael. What if we're not dealing with a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman, but we're dealing with a, a non-Jewish man and a Jewish woman? So the, in terms of the Avera, presumably, it should be the same. But he says, no, lo shamanu sheyeh bakaret, there is no indication, right? This is a, um, an exception to the rule. It doesn't matter you know, whether, generally speaking, um, if the, we, we generally look at the Gilui um, Arayot uh, as being uh, equal opportunity. You know, it's the, the penalty and the nature of the Avera is the same for, uh, for both people who are involved in this illicit relationship. But here we say no. If it's a non-Jewish woman and a Jewish man, so then it becomes karet. Then we have the whole idea of kanai poginbo, etc. But if it's reversed and it's a Jewish woman with a non-Jewish man, so then that doesn't hold. Uh, that's no longer the case. Why? The Ran so says vidinhu, and this makes perfect sense. Um, namely, dinhu. The Israel and if Elat Lakuti Binai Mashech Akarev Ye Israel. Ella Bala Kuti Havlad in Shakarecha. Okay, so the difference is is whether or not the the child, in other words, this goes again back to the issue of the Kedusha. 
the kedusha of the of the child is not in danger if the father is non-Jewish. And because of that, the nature of the um, of the relationship is viewed in a different lens than in the situation where it's a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman. When it's a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman, since the the child will not be Jewish, so then the 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 the, the, the nature of the Avera is one of a violation of kedusha, and there that changes everything. It becomes a um, an avera where you could have um, karet attached to it, and it also becomes a situation where, um, as we said at the outset, where you can have kanaim pogim. So, to sum up, you know, as as always, there's still makarot left on the sheet for another time. But the idea that w- what we have here is that you see a um, the um, a relationship where the um, the notion of kanaim is um, is being very limited to specific situations, at least by, in, in, according to the halacha and chazal, very specific situations where the um, um, where the uh, the kedusha of Am Yisrael as a whole is um, is, is at risk, or the kedusha of Am Yisrael, or the kedusha of the mikdash is at risk, and not in situations where even if the Avera is a very severe Avera, it was uh, Shabbat, Avodah Zarah, etc., we wouldn't uh, say it. So therefore, if you were to, just to put it into a modern context, right, so then presumably, Halakha would frown on um, anyone throwing a stone uh, against a car driving by on Shabbat. That is not an example of Kanaim Pogin. That is, would go against the, the Halakha. Um, and presumably, the, this is for another discussion, though someone sent me out privately on the chat, the question, presumably political um, zealotry as well um, would not be sanctioned um, halachically. Um, okay, so, I'm, uh, so that's for the shir. Um, uh, they continued som kal um, and um, a uh, uh, Shabbat uh, shalom. Hold to it.